All right, so last time we were together, we talked about characters and how uh, basically you are a character in the story of life. Uh, we talked about the personal uh, traits or the personality traits, the relational traits, and also the physical traits of characters. And the time before that, we also talked about the role of the writer in storytelling. And we concentrated specifically on the settings during that particular time period and talked about how important it is to really get your writing down because if you don't get your writing down, your videos aren't going to be good that follow because we care about the story, right? So if we don't get the story down and we don't really have an idea of what's going on, then how are we even really going to be able to produce this? How are we going to be able to, to put it together and then also be able to edit it and, and do things from there? So today, uh, we're going to continue talking about some of that stuff and actually trying to pull all that stuff together. Um, you also worked on your story outline as well as your story treatments. Hopefully most, if not all of those are done. And that way we can kind of move on to what it is we're going to be discussing today. Today we're talking about the pitch and the script. So my question for you guys in order to first start out today, pretty simplistic. What is a pitch and why is it important in business? So this isn't just with video production. It's important to business as well. And the reason why we really need to know why it's important to not just video, but also the business is because when you're creating films, it is a business. Yes, you can do it for fun. Yes, you can kind of do stuff on the side on your own. But if you don't really know how to utilize things that you like to do um, for passive entertainment, uh, things like taking pictures, drawing, and so on and so forth, you don't know how to make money off of that. Um, that's, that's income that you're losing. Um, you can actually can make a whole lot of money off stuff that's just passive income that you don't even realize that you're using. So uh, my question today is, what is the pitch and why is it important to business? And I want you guys to choose the individual that was the youngest person to get a paying job in your group as your group's speaker. All right, two minutes. We'll be right back. Do, 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 do. ambient sound in the background, right? All right, uh, here we go. So uh, normally this is the part where you guys would share out with one another and so on and so forth, and we'd, we'd hear you a little bit more. Um, but it's interesting the kind of the responses that I typically tend to get when we go through this. Um, I was uh, 13, I want to say, 12, 13, when I, w when I first started to um, get paid to do stuff, to actually start to get a paying job. Um, and the reason why was because I was in seventh grade, so I guess I was 12. Uh, I was in seventh grade, and my parents decided to pull me out of public school and instead homeschool me for a little bit. And so because of being able to be homeschooled, I, can, I could really um, work in video production as well as in theater and, and really kind of study my craft a little bit more. Well, because I had all this extra time at my house, my mom was like, we should try and see if we can find you a job. So I ended up getting a job um, shoveling hay crap, or not hay crap, horse crap in hay stalls for eight hours a, eight hours a day. Um, and I did this for, I want to say, two, three times a week or something like that, um, getting paid $15 an hour, which back in the late 90s, early 2000s, that's a lot of money 
to, to, to do that because it's, it's hard physical manual labor. And I was allergic to hay as well. So that, it sucked literally to be in there shoveling horse crap and kind of running through, through all that stuff and, and doing that, especially when I come home covered in hives and so on and so forth. But it was really nice, it was really good because I had my own money. I could start helping my family out doing whatever it is they wanna do. I could buy things that I wanted to buy. Um, it was one of the ways that I began to really broaden and branch out to become more of like how I am today, more like an adult, right? Um, the only difference between being a kid and adult is instead of being responsible for those younger than you, you're now just being responsible for yourself. Um, if, you're, if you're already 12, 13, 14, 15 and, and are being responsible for your younger brother or sister, you're already well on your way to being an adult, right? It's all about responsibility. Kids rely on people that are older to take care of them. The adults rely on themselves to take care of themselves. So anyways, the reason why that all ended up coming together was because I really wanted to, or, and my mom really wanted me to, branch out and start becoming more of an adult. And that was the way to do it, was by getting a job. So we found a place where we could actually, uh, where I could actually be utilized, and I was utilized in that particular space. But the only way I was able to be utilized in that space was by being able to pitch to that individual why I would be good for that particular position. And the way I was able to do that was by coming up with the story. Gave them my background. Talked about how I, uh, how I took care of horses at my house. My sister was really proficient in riding, right? So I already had a background in, in understanding how to clean up horse poo, right? I mean, that's pretty much all I'd be doing. Of course, I was feeding them as well, but mostly it was just cleaning out the stalls and stuff. So I'm giving him my story. I'm giving him the written or a visual account of events that have happened before and telling it for entertaining purposes, but also telling him so that we can learn a lesson or a moral as to why I would be good for this particular position. Okay. We, I also included when I was talking to this guy about eventually the, about this job that I would eventually end up having, um, I was telling him my background, where I had worked before, what the type of horses I took care of, how I knew when things were right or wrong, what I would do in certain situations. Could I actually tie a knot correctly when I'm tying horses up so that way they don't break their necks, right? I'm giving him setting characters, events, development, climax, resolution, and trying to tell him and convince him why I am perfect for this particular position. And again, I'm in seventh grade, right? So being able to utilize this in a job aspect definitely has its benefits when it comes to film because not only was I telling him how I got started and where I got started, but I'm trying to tell him how this fits in the story of my life and how I can fit this in three times a week, right? Because most seventh graders are in school during the day. Instead, I would be able to wake up at six, go work for him for up until about noon or so, come home, do all my schoolwork, and then still have some time to go play basketball afterwards if I wanted to, and that would basically be my day, right? So I'm giving him the beginning, the middle, and the end of, of my particular story. All this cohered and put together is what's called a pitch. A pitch is best described as the giving of a reason as to why something should or should not happen. If you don't have your notes, I'll go ahead and uh, log in and do all your other stuff, making sure that you got that stuff in front of you uh, for today, because today's a little bit long. But you're, you're trying to convince someone why they should or should not do something with a pitch. Okay? If your friend is about to go to a party and start drinking, you're giving them a pitch as to why they should come along with you. Hey, let's go do this thing we probably shouldn't, shouldn't be doing. Or you're convincing them not to. Hey, don't go do this. This X, Y, and Z could happen as a result. Either way, you're, you're pitching, you're, you're, giving a, a, you're trying to convince a person, and you're giving that person the decision to try and do or not do something. And, and so when you're utilizing a pitch when it comes to video production, you've got to convince not only me, but everyone in the class that you should be telling the story that, you're, that you want to tell. And that there's a reason why you have, want to tell this story as opposed to this story. Now some of you might want to write a story where there, there are certain things that happen in the video. There's certain things that would happen more in PG-13 films or rated R films, right? You got to convince not just me, but other people that this particular thing that's happening should be happening. It's important to tell this particular story. Right? If someone's going to get on social media and slam someone else about something, you've got to be able to pitch them on the idea of why that's important to your story. And what's interesting is that typically when you guys get in trouble or I get in trouble or anyone else gets in trouble, we try and pitch our way out of it. We try to convince people that, hey, 
maybe, uh, maybe, yeah, we, we should be allowed to do that. Or I didn't really mean to because of X, Y, and Z, right? So the pitch actually is, is really, really important when it comes to video. Now, I don't have all day to listen to you guys tell your stories, right? Because your stories can be long. You can have a lot of stuff that's being told in your particular story, OK? There can be, uh, you might end up having like a five minute video. I don't have five minutes to sit down and listen to it. So when you guys give your pitch here in class, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a, a timer on my, on my stopwatch or my phone for one minute. In theory, it doesn't matter how long your film is, two hours, 60 minutes, if you're going to make a, a trilogy, you should be able to summarize and tell me everything that's going to happen in that particular story in one minute or less. Why? Because people don't have all day long to sit there and listen to you as you're talking about how cool it would be to do this or how cool it would be to do that. Cool. Awesome. That's good to know. I'm, I'm glad you have um, um, certain information on, on how to do things. But that, that's, that takes time away from me and my day and what I could be doing. So when it comes to the pitch, you really need to target your particular audience and, and know what it is you're pitching. Because if someone's going to give you money to go make a film, if I, if I was to pay you guys for how many hours you actually put in for each of these stories, let's just say I pay you minimum wage. right? Let's just, let's just say minimum wage is $15. Okay. In class, you'll be spending at least 15 hours on this particular project. Right? 15 times 15 is what, 225? 225? Sounds about right. $225, something like that. Yeah, I'm going to say yes, it's 225. Right? $225 for you to work on this story. Times that by five people that are in your group. Total. That's over $1,000 to work on this particular story. Why should I be paying you $1,000 to work on this particular story, right? Because when it comes to economics and putting video, videos together, that becomes really, really important for individuals in generating funding. Because right? if you're not getting money on the back side of things, and you're not going to be able to put money out to make a good production. Okay. So learning how to pitch is really important. So here's a video of what we're, how we're going to be doing this in the class. Okay. That's again taken from AFI Screen uh, Film Ed. Okay. And you'll hear they will specifically talk about how and why it is important for you to learn to pitch your particular ideas and how we're going to be working with it in class as well. This is what we're going to be doing for every project that you go through this year, except for the individual ones because we don't really have a whole lot of time to listen to every single person's pitch. The pitch is when you verbally present your project to your peers and teacher. It's based on your treatment and the academic standards you've defined. Your goal is to have your classmates and teacher grant you a green light to produce your idea. You may present your idea any way you want, but keep in mind that you're selling your idea so that your film will be made. I'm Gabby Martinez. I'm Larry. I'm Jordan. I'm Brenda Cortez. And I'm Hector. Okay, and um, just so we don't confuse you, um, the first part of our presentation is going to be a small segment of what we're going to be filming in our film. And it's um, a news broadcast about the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914. So much of the pitch actually involves performance, communication. It's a real sales tool. And if you don't have your product in mind, if you don't have a clear idea of what your product is, your presentation is going to fail. If you begin the pitch with a clear treatment, a clear outline of what your story is, each step, the beginning, the middle, and the end, your presentation will accurately convey to your audience what your plan is, what your story is, and how you're going to tell it. Then there are a number of specific things you can do to make an effective pitch. Create supporting graphics that are large enough for everyone to see. Maintain eye contact with your audience. Use gestures or a pointer to direct the eyes of the audience. And keep a pace that's consistent with your story. Highlight certain key shots or elements. And try using sound effects or quote some dialogue, anything to help sell your idea. When you're pitching um, your idea, uh, one thing that I often do, now this is how I do it with the studios, and it's, it's worked, is one, tell them why you want to do it. And there should be 
some kind of enthusiasm. Well, I picked this project because I just really liked it and told this, and I think it could really be cool if I did this. Good evening, and welcome to another edition of CKY World News at Night. For our top story today, there will be there are severe thunderstorms in some major cities in Excuse Europe. Excuse me, Larry. Um, this is just in. The Archduke of Austria-Hungary, Franz Ferdinand, and his wife Sophie have been assassinated. The first thing you have to do when you present your ideas is you've got to put them out there, and it's a risk because people might not accept them at first. And once the students get used to the idea that they're pitching their ideas, and that people are going to think about their ideas and respond critically, but not negatively, that it becomes a safer environment that reduces the stress in the classroom, a lot more creativity, more room for critical thinking, and you're learning, but you're having fun at the same time, which is great. Peer review is important because you are, you're, as a group, uh, exploring and developing a body of experience from actually doing something. And I think you tend to listen to critique from people who are also experiencing the same thing as you are um, and are your contemporaries as opposed to teachers lecturing to you about the way things should be. Toward the end, you just might want to have a set scene because it seems like you're just doing a day-by-day -day thing. Just a set scene, something happens that you already know. Just decide on what the end is going to be, just to kind of wrap everything up. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like a lot of news stations, well, that's it for now, you know, see you next time on it. I think we do have an yeah, ending we have where, a little ending, yes. uh, basically, it's going to be one of the news anchors saying, well, it looks like this is the start of World War One." Yeah, and it's going to fade out. Yeah. That's what we're going to do. That's what the last word's going to be. I think it was really nice to get everyone's reactions. Like, we did have a couple funny parts, and... Our ending was really somber, so it was nice to hear the laughter and the silence. And the applause at the end was great, you know, because you put so much work into it. And it's so short, and it, like everything just flew by so fast. And it's, it's great to know that people really appreciated it. So, approved or not approved? Approved. Approved? approved? OK, looks like you've been approved. Great job, and start working on your script. Definitely helped to go in front of the class and get their input on it. It gave us a different point of view. And they were telling us things that we hadn't even thought of because from an outside point of view looking in, we completely looked over some things that they told us which would have made that one better. You need to pitch and revise your presentation until it receives the green light by your class and teacher. But if you go into the process prepared and enthusiastic, you should get approval to move forward without too much trouble. Approved or not approved? Do they have enough? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so approved. Great job. Let's give them a big hand. Okay, you've done your research, written your outline and treatment, and been given the green light to make your movie. But you're still not done with pre-production. You still have to write a script and prepare storyboards. And it's those two aspects of filmmaking that we'll explore in the next chapter of AFI's screen education process. Would have been nice if I had my microphone on, right? <clears throat> Anyways, um, yeah. So that's what we're going to be doing here in class. You guys will get up and you will give a quick little one minute pitch to the rest of the class. And people will either approve or not approve your project based on how well you're able to convince us that this looks like a good story, right? So I've had people get up and pitch, pitch their ideas. And they think it's funny to them. And they're the only ones laughing in class. Um, it's great, awesome. That's the entertaining side, but the lesser moral is you're, you're not doing too good, you suck, right? We need to go back to the table and figure out how we can make this a little bit better. It doesn't mean we throw everything away, because remember, we want to try and add the bad ideas out on the table. The more bad ideas that we have out on the table, the more likely we are to get to a good idea, right? So it's, it's not a bad thing to have, to have your ideas out on the table. What, it, what is bad is, is to let that demoralize you and let, let you fail. Okay, pick yourself back up, figure out where you can go, utilize this, this, and this, put this together, and now you go off in this particular direction. Typically, what ends up being uh, really bad about people's pitch, pitches is they have no objective in mind. They, they're literally just there to make themselves laugh and be entertained, and at the end of the day, that's just who is entertained, just themselves. 
and then it makes sense why they don't have a whole lot of friends and they stay at home just watching Netflix all the time and so on and so forth because they're only trying to entertain themselves. They're not being valuable to other individuals. Sure, if you want to go that route. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's only what we'd be doing uh, today. But for the purposes of today, I'm trying to combine a couple of things together and, and, and trying to give you guys a, a good broad overview um, of not just the pitch, but also script writing. Um, so before we hop into script writing, let me kind of backtrack just slightly. Um, Seinfeld, you've seen me use a couple examples from their, uh, from their, vid uh, from their series. Uh, they had a, an idea for their show, and this, was a, this is like meta on meta. This is Seinfeld talking about Seinfeld becoming Seinfeld. Um, and I'm, I'm not even kidding you as I'm, as I'm going through that. Um, what's really interesting is how these guys sat around basically a coffee shop. It was basically just a coffee shop. And, and started coming up with their ideas for uh, their show. Because they had an idea for a show that they wanted to pitch to NBC. And that show ended up turning into Seinfeld. Um, this is called the nothing pitch. But it, it's pitching stuff the same way that you would do in here in class, except here, they're trying to, George is trying to convince Jerry that this is a good idea to kind of set out and do. Um, and you'll see that even when he talks about nothing, nothing ends up being something. And it's kind of interesting the direction that they end up going as a result of that. So let's go ahead and take a listen in to the nothing pitch. So what's happening with the TV show? You come up with anything? No, nothing. Why don't they have salsa on the table? What do you need salsa for? Salsa is now the number one condiment in America. Do you know why? Because people like to say salsa. <laughs> Excuse me, do you have any salsa? We need more salsa. Where's the salsa? No salsa. You know, it must be impossible for a Spanish person to order salsa and not get salsa. <laughs> I wanted salsa, not salsa. <laughs> so do you know the difference between salsa and salsa? You have the salsa after the salsa. <laughs> This should be the show. This is the show. What? This. Just talk. Yeah, right. No, I'm really serious. I think that's a good idea. Just talking? Well, what's the show about? It's about nothing. No story? No, forget the story. You gotta have a story. Who says you gotta have a story? Remember when we were waiting for, for that table in that Chinese restaurant that time? That could be a TV show. And who's on the show? Who are the characters? I could be a character. You? Yeah, you base a character on me. So on the show, there's a character named George Costanza? Yeah. What? There's something wrong with that? I'm a character. People are always saying to me, you know, you're quite a character. <laughs> and who else is on the show? Elaine could be a character. Kramer. Now, he's a character. <laughs> so everybody I know is a character on the show. Right. And it's about nothing. Absolutely nothing. So you're saying I go into NBC and tell them I got this idea for a show about nothing. We go into NBC. We? Since when are you a writer? What writer? We're talking about a sitcom. You want to go with me to NBC? Yeah, I think we really got something here. What do we got? An idea. What idea? An idea for the show. I still don't know what the idea is. It's about nothing. Right. Everybody's doing something. We'll do nothing. <laughs> so we go into NBC, we tell them we got an idea for a show about nothing. Exactly. They say, what's your show about? I say, nothing. There you go. I think you may have something here. Right. OK. Because even though it was really dumb and really stupid, it still made sense, right? He was still listing off the setting, the characters, okay? The different things that'll happen on the show. At the end of the day, what lesson or moral are we supposed to learn, right? The lesson or moral we're supposed to learn is that don't be like these guys, nothing, nothing. You can either choose to be like them or not choose to be like them. I'm gonna leave that decision up to you, okay? But it, it, it is kind of really kind of a, it, if you actually go back and watch Seinfeld, it's really a selfish show. A selfish show. Like, it's about four individuals who really just go about living their lives and doing whatever they can to appease themselves. And the only thing that they like, uh, the, only, the only reason why they like these other three people is because they need other people in their lives, right? It's, it's actually, it's kind of a sad show. Narc it's very narcissistic in that way. Um, but again, that's what the show was based on. That's how they came up with the idea for the show, and that's how they pitched it, okay? So that's what the pitch is. So we'll be doing that from each and every project. And we, we'll be doing that next time around. We'll be pitching our ideas out to people. Today, I want you guys to get started on a script. And so since we're going to get started on the script, 
I need for, to get here from you guys and figure out um, what are the components of a script, right? Because if we really begin to understand or really want to understand how to actually write a script and write a good script, we need to be able to know how to break it down. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes to sit down and discuss what are the components of the script. Producers, appoint a speaker for your group this time because now you guys are in charge of things. All right, cool, let's get back into it, right? Cool, so I'm sure some of the components you guys thought up were dialogue, right? Every, when everyone uh, hears a script, immediately all they think of is dialogue. That's one of them, right? Because what if you have a film with no words? No one says anything, right? Like those Disney shorts that usually come up uh, right before the Pixar films. Right? Sometimes they'll have the Disney animated Pixar stuff right before you go see like Inside Out or some other stuff like that. Right? Typically those, like Birds on a Wire, have no words in them. How do you still have a script for something like that? Right? And so that's kind of what I want to break down today before I start showing you guys how to utilize our screenwriting software. If you're not logged into the computers as well today, you might want to make sure you go ahead and do so because there's going to be a website I'm going to have you guys go to and start logging into to register your stuff up uh, or register yourself up for it because you're going to be needing this throughout the year here in a little bit. Um, but but I, I really kind of want to focus down on what the components are of a script. It's not just dialogue. There's other stuff that's needed too, right? So as I continue to go through and talk about these different things, that's something I want, I want you to keep in mind, okay? A script can be, or the components of a script can be broken down into three basic parts. You have your scene slash action, which I'll get into here in a little bit. So. It'll, it'll, take, it'll take a little bit, but I'll get there, I promise. Okay, scenes slash action. You have blocking, which we discussed before, and that's the movement or the placement of characters or objects within scenes. And then you have the dialogue. Okay, that's the conversation between the two individuals. Okay, the better you understand these particular components of a script, the better your story's gonna be. Now, in a lot of ways, you set yourself up for success because you started writing stuff down in your story outline. The reason why we start with an outline first before we jump into a script, <coughs> excuse me, is because if you don't have that outline to jump into and you start writing dialogue back and forth between characters or you start moving in a particular scene like for action and so on and so forth, um, you can get yourself lost in a corner, right? This is where people like start trying to, ha or start trying to say they have writer's block. There really isn't a, th a thing such, a, such thing as a writer's block. Right? Because, again, you can always write down a written or a visual uh, account of events, either real or imaginary, and you're telling it for entertainment or lesson, uh, take two. Uh, let's try this again. <laughs> um, entertainment or lesson uh, or a moral, right? That's why we're writing it. But if you just kind of go off in one direction and you don't even realize where you're going, you can get lost very easily, right? It's like someone who uh, takes a walk in the woods, they're on a path, 
And then all of a sudden, they go off the path, take a look at something, and then that leads them to something else. And they, before they know it, they turn around, they go, wait, where's the path? Right? That's writer's block. And so to keep yourself from leaving the path, you have an outline. Right? And then you've already walked down that path very briefly in your treatment. So now when it comes time for us to write a script, uh, we kind of know how that path actually works. And this time, as you're walking down that path, instead of just looking forward, you can look side to side and start noticing things that maybe you might not have noticed before about some stuff that you've written down. Okay? That's the reason why we start straight there. Because then eventually, when you take it and go film, well, now you've been down this path so many times. You know the story right, uh, right and left. All of a sudden, you can add in other elements on top of that. And you don't just notice what kind of trees are around you. You notice the birds and the, and the animals that are up in the trees. Right? So you go from outlining, which is uh, basically figuring out a path in the forest, to writing a treatment, which is, OK, looking down at that path and following it again to make sure that that path leads you from point A to point B to writing a script where now you can look around as you're on that path and notice nature that's to your left and to your right, to eventually when you start to film, oh, you notice stuff up above you, like up in the trees. Those are your birds and, and um, animals and, and other tree life that's available there, right? And then when you get into editing, well, now you can start taking out all the stuff that you don't like, right, that's naturally around you. So that's kind of what it's like to actually build a, a, a particular video production. So why do we have scripts? Well, like I said, um, that, that pathway that was kind of developed in the story treatment, um, uh, that w when you bring it back and you start going through things again, if you start walking that path, you can start kind of breaking it down and start realizing about how much time you're going to be spending along that path. Okay? And what happens in each part of that path as you're continuing to walk along it. So why do we have scripts? Because scripts break stories down into segments. Those segments are called scenes. And if we know what's going to happen in scene one versus scene two versus scene three, we can really start to pick out and add in different details um, according to what we need to have happen for that scene to move to the next one. Right? So a script consists of a story broken down into different segments called scenes. Scenes give a brief overview of what is happening in the story. They don't give everything. It doesn't give full and complete detail. Right? Because the director is going to fill that in uh, a little bit later on. As a matter of fact, only basic detail is given when you're starting to write down stuff in your script. Right? Just enough information for your crew to get by. Just enough information for your talent to get by. Uh, just enough information for everyone to uh, be on the same page as you're developing a scene. Full detail is to be filled in later on by the director. Now, you guys are lucky enough to have a director on board as you're writing your story. So you'll notice that typically you have one person or, or more that are, that's kind of like leading your, your group, right? They're actually able to fill in that detail as you're writing your particular story. Most of the time in the film production industry, you don't get that. Directors show up and they kind of fill in the details as, as, they, as they see them, right? If you're going to go film a football game, how do you film that as it's happening and developing, right? You have to have a director who's on scene who has been down that path many times can see where different things branch out and go, here's how we're going to fill in this, here's how we're going to fill in that, here's how we're going to uh, make detail here, here's what I need you to do, and so on and so forth. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. Scripts also have only basic notes for the person reading along. Right? It's very brief. It's enough for the story to make sense to give people a decision as to whether or not they should or should not begin to invest further time and money into this particular story. Right, because time is money. How much time you're going to be spending on this and what you're going to be doing with it could potentially lead to a loss or lead to a gain, especially when it has to do with monetary funds. So that's why scripts. So now let's break each one of these down. Right? Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start breaking this down. Components of a script. First thing we have is the scene setup or the action. Okay. Now there's a couple of different types of scripts that you'll focus on for this particular, um, um, for, for each particular script that you write. Okay, we're going to do two different types of scripts in this class. First one we're going to work on starting today is the screenplay. The second type of script we're going to work on is the audiovisual format, the AV format, or the two column script. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later on, closer when we start working on the music video. Okay, first part, or the first thing that we have in the scene setup or the action is what's called the scene heading. Now the scene heading gives a very brief description of the setting. It's so brief that there's only three parts to it. Okay? You have interior or exterior, or INT or EXT. The location, sorry, not the location, the setting, location will be filled in later on. 
So you have the setting, so interior, exterior, so are we inside or outside? Okay. The setting, what's the place that we're actually in? Right. And then the time of day. Those are the three things that we need to know in order to set the scene. Right, so I'll give you an example. Right now, currently, we are interior E239 day. We're inside. This room is E239. It is during the day. Okay. Another way to, to film that or set that up in a story setting is interior classroom during the day. Because right? if I go with E239, that's, that's a physical location. That's actually not a setting. It could be a setting, but it's where I'm going to be filming that particular scene. If I wanted to swap out a classroom and just have any generic classroom, this could be E239, this could be E215, this could be e, or, uh, W101, whatever, whatever rooms we have over in the West Hall, because people in the East Hall never seem to go over to West Hall. right? <coughs> so if you just summarize it down to interior classroom, you can swap out your location, and it would still make sense. Now, if it has to be E239, you want to make sure E239 is listed. But otherwise, for the most part, you want to try and be not vague. You want to be as detailed as possible. I wouldn't even say as possible. Detailed as needed, right? In order for in order for everything to make sense. Okay. Next part. After we have the scene heading, okay, and that details to be filled in by the by the director and the producer later on. Next thing we have is the action. Okay. So we have our scene heading. Then we have the action underneath of that. Now here's, there's two things that the action does, and we're going to split them up. First thing that we're talking about, action gives a brief description of the character or the characters. Anytime a character is introduced, we need to understand what makes that character that character. Now it doesn't have to be exactly at that point, right? If I was talking about my story today of Mr. Sipe enters E239, I don't have to say, Mr. Sipe, a tall, six foot, uh, a, a six foot tall uh, teacher, walks in the classroom. You don't need to say it right there. You can always do, Mr. Sipe walks in the classroom. Mr. Sipe, a six foot tall uh, uh, school teacher, or whatever, begins to teach and lecture students on how to write scripts. Right? You can slightly introduce it. You can introduce it slightly later. But for the most part, anytime you introduce a character, we need to have a description of who and what that character is, not just a name. A name is a name. A character is more than a name, right? You are more than just uh, um, Lily, or more than just Larry, or more than just Johnny, right? You are you are uh, Johnny the basketball player. You you are uh, Lily the actress, right? So you want to be a little bit more descriptive of your particular characters when you first introduce them. Again, details to be filled in later on by the director or the producer or the talent even, right? Because you might want to swap out. It's one talent for another. Can you do that? If so, you don't need to be as detailed with that particular character, right? You only need to hit certain things that are needed for people to understand what that character is supposed to be doing and why that character is doing it. Okay? The second thing the action does gives information about the event or the events that are happening. Right? So if I'm lecturing, I can describe how many students are in the room. Does it matter how many students are in the room? For right now, all you know, there could be nobody in here. Right? Depends on how I want to tell that particular story. So when you're describing your particular ideas that you have in your head about what is happening, you want to be as detailed as needed, not as detailed as possible. That, hopefully that makes sense. That doesn't mean you don't have to put in a whole lot. It means I need to know just enough to where I don't have to ask a question about the thing. Right? Because again, the director's going to fill in the details later on. So they can, they can keep writing or talking about whatever it is, or they can come up with whatever they want to. They might even ask the writer to change some things in the script, right? But you need to be as, as detailed as needed, not as detailed as possible, as so, some people and some teachers in other classrooms might say you need to be, right? Be extremely, extremely detailed, right? In my case, I need to be able to know enough to get by, okay? Blocking. Okay, this is the, the, the next part of a component of a script. Blocking. Okay, typically this is used as a parenthetical, and this will make sense once we start opening up Celtics and start begin, uh, begin to start writing our script. There's two ways you can write blocking for scenes inside of a um, inside of a particular script, right? 
The first part, when it, par when it comes to parenthetical, you can give the movement of the characters within a scene. So if a character is about to start doing, or a character is about to do something as they are talking, like for example, I am walking right now as I am talking, I would put in the character slot, Mr. Sipe, underneath of that, I would put the parenthetical, begins walking forward, and then underneath that, I would put dialogue and, and what it is that I'm going to say. Right? <clears throat> so the blocking, the parenthetical, gives the movement of the character as they are talking or as they're speaking. Okay? Usually it's written before a line of dialogue, not necessarily always written right uh, before a dialogue. Okay? If it's different, if something's supposed to happen before I start speaking, like for example, Mr. Sipe walks, then he stops, and then I start speaking, that's a totally different movement than Mr. Sipe walks and talks as he's speaking, right? You can differentiate between those two things as you're writing your script by how you write it. Okay, this is where formatting comes in. This is why punctuation's important, right? I know when you're sending out text messages to people, punctuation doesn't really matter a whole lot. There you go. Punctuation doesn't seem to matter a whole lot, right? Because the person can kind of know your voice. But for people that don't know your voice and don't know your cadence and don't know your rhythm, you have to add in the punctuation. You have to add in commas. You have to add in semicolons. You have to add in hyphens, right? Because then other people will know, oh, that's what that person's trying to do. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but when you write your papers and turn it into your teachers, you're not writing them for you. You're writing it so the teacher understands what it is you're saying. Right? You're not just trying to write to get stuff across to a particular teacher or a particular individual. You're specifically trying to write so that way they understand what it is you're trying to say. Two completely different things. Okay. So when it comes to writing your script, you're going to see me. People always say, I'm a grammar Nazi, and I go crazy. I'm always over your shoulder looking at your script. Right? Is this thing, is this thing exact? The reason why is because I don't understand it. I need better instruction as you guys are writing. Is this really where you're going to pause? Did you really forget to leave the period at the end of the sentence? Right? Are we still actually continuing that thought or not? Right? So that's the first part. Second part, it gives information about where objects are in scenes. So for example, I could be talking and pick up an object at the same time. Okay? Otherwise, another thing I could do is I could be talking, I could pick up the object and then continue to talk. Two completely different ways of going about it. If I pick up the object while I'm talking, that's where the parenthetical comes in, as I drop that and caught it at the same time. It's pretty great, right? <clears throat> yeah, I know. You can almost watch that on replay if you wanted to, right? Slow-mo. Right? <clears throat> yeah, I know. So anyways, parenthetical. You can say, Mr. Sipe is, is talking, and as I'm talking, picks up a pen and continues to talk and to lecture. You don't have to start a new sentence. You can literally say, Mr. Sipe, uh, Mr. Sipe is lecturing, picks up pen, and continues on as he discusses about script writing. Right? So there's certain ways that you can, you can add different stuff into your story as you're, working on your particular, as you're working on your particular script. And they mean different things. Okay? And you'll see that here in a, in a second once I start showing you guys a couple of examples. Last thing. Okay? Dialogue. Okay? Dialogue exists specifically to give your characters depth and to give your story depth. All video should not have talking or discussion unless it progresses the story deeper or pushes the character deeper. If you want to progress the story forward, have an action do it. Now that action can be someone saying something in a particular way, and that action could be part of that particular dialogue, but we shouldn't have people talking just to talk, right? One of the things that's really, really boring about BNN is constantly having two hosts up there discussing and talking about things. It's boring to sit there and watch people talking. As a matter of fact, you're probably bored watching this right now. Yeah, I know. Thank you. <laughs> right? It sucks. Why? Because it doesn't feel like I'm, I'm pushing us forward. I'm having us, to, I'm, I'm having us stop and pause, and I'm causing us to go deeper. Now the problem is, is if you stop and pause and go deeper, it doesn't feel like you're going anywhere, then what's the point, right? But if you stop and pause and have the conversation go deep, deep enough to where people begin to understand, oh, that makes sense here, that makes sense there, that, that's how you progress things and move things forward. 
right? Typically, women like to do this. Women will try and get guys to stop and have a conversation with them. Why? Because it progresses their relationship deeper. Guys are constantly saying, hey, let's go out there and let's go do things, right? That causes the, the relationship or uh, the progression to move forward, right? That's the reason why a girls ty uh, typically, again, it's not always like this, but typically girls love it when guys take them out and push them forward somewhere while discussing things because you're doing two things at one time, right? You're getting to know each other more deeply while also going somewhere and doing something with that individual. And if you do that repetitiously enough, well, then you know you can trust and rely on that person, right? So dialogue, when you're actually coming up with it for scripts, use it as, as information to give attitudes about characters towards particular things, and use, this, use it to tell us more about the events that are happening, right? Don't just use it to tell us what's happening. That's boring. Show us. You've heard the phrase, show, don't tell. The reason why you want to show it more as opposed to telling it is because people will get bored if you're just constantly telling them what they should or should not think. Let them think for themselves. But the really good stuff, and you'll see this in the second semester when we watch Inception, is where they tell you something and they, you don't realize it's really telling you about something else. And the only way you can get to the something else is by watching it in action. And once you see that happen and see that turn that individuals have, you go, aha. I knew it. I felt like I knew it all along. Audiences love that. You guys love that. When I start telling you something, you go, oh, yeah, that's right. I knew it. Or I confirm like, a suspicion that you might have had. Right? We like to be right about certain things. So if you can set up in your writing when you're right and when you're wrong, and when the audience is supposed to be right and when the audience is supposed to be wrong, and just dialogue in action, that's how you know you're telling a good story. Okay? So dialogue should be used to give characters depth and give story depth. Shouldn't be used just for individuals to talk, right? We need to be going somewhere with it. Always, always going somewhere. Never, never standing still. Two people are just talking back and forth, feels like we're standing still. That's the reason why on BNN we constantly switch things. Okay, we have animated bumpers. We'll go out and do video here. You'll see a different picture here. People will talk over something as the video changes, right? Because the video is pushing us forward, the conversation is pushing, pushing us downward, okay? Last, last slide, last screen. And then, yeah, I know, right? Last screen, and then um, I'll show you guys how to do some dialogue, or how to start writing a script, and then we're gonna get started writing a script today, okay? Types of script, okay? There's typically five types of script that you guys will be dealing with as a part of being a part of this program. So I'm gonna try and see if I can get all those out as much as I possibly can. First thing we're going over today is a screenplay. Screenplay gives direction uh, to the talent and inspiration to the crew. Right? Basic notes, basic understanding, basic understanding of the story. If you're a writer, you probably love writing screenplays. Just so you know, the writing is not the end all to be all. The writing gives people enough of a foundation from which to leap to make greater things. So it's great that you're good at laying that foundation if you're a writer. But you've got to help people make that leap to actually putting, putting it into production and making it a reality. Okay, audiovisual script, this gives a written or a visual account of visual and auditory sequences, typically on the right side. Uh, sorry, on the left side, you have video and the shot that you're going to get. On the left side, or sorry, on the right side, geez, man, I swear I'm going to get my directions con uh, convinced. Okay, so on the left side, you have video. On the right side, you have audio. What audio goes along with each of those shots? Is music still playing while you're on this shot? Is there dialogue at this particular shot? If so, what is that dialogue? Do we have other shots going over the top of this dialogue at this part? Right? So that's what an audiovisual script is, and we'll touch on that a little bit more, like I said, when we get to the music videos. Lighting script gives information to the lighting director about what, how things are supposed to be lit. Right? An audio script gives directions to the audio engineer about how the audio sequences are supposed to progress. And then the camera script. Camera script gives direction about the type of shots a director wants for a particular position. If you ever go to like a pro football game or a pro baseball game, basketball game, pro sporting event, and so on and so forth, you'll notice that cameras are locked down in, in positions. Typically, on those cameras locked down, you will find a binder, much like this guy right here, okay, that's attached to it. The reason why is because when a camera operator shows up, if they've never worked in that stadium before, all they have to do is consult the binder to know what shots that camera is responsible for. Someone has written down all 100, 150 different types of shots that that particular position is supposed to get. 
Okay, if you're working the Super Bowl, where there's 96 cameras, it's a lot. Actually, this past year it was 108, I think, because they had end zone cameras. It's a lot of cameras, right? But each one of those cameras, someone has gone through and written down exactly what's needed at each of those positions. So that way, everything is covered. All directions are covered. People aren't shooting the same type of shot at each particular point. You'll see when we do our rallies, each camera position has, has particular shots they're supposed to get where they're at. They're not supposed to be overlapping. Right? And when it all works together, it feels like a dance. Right? If you go back and watch our senior rallies from last year, oh, it's gorgeous. Okay? It just, the camera operators are just dancing with each other. They just know where the other person's going to be, so they can think about what shot they want to get next. Right? It's very pretty, very nice how that, how that turns out. Okay? So those are your types of scripts. Okay, so before we start finishing up work on our, on our egg story, let's go ahead and see how, how a script actually looks, and let's watch it actually occur in action. Right, so I've got a script for you. Um, it's from the film from 2003. It's written by John August. It's called Big Fish. Okay. And I'll go ahead and put this up so that way you guys can see it a little bit nicer, a little bit better. Okay. So here's Big Fish. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start going through this and pointing out different things to you. Okay, as we're going through and taking a look at this, so that way you can kind of know and understand um, what, what the writer is trying to do with this particular story. Okay, so page one, you can kind of see right here, right, we have our, we have our opening title sequence and stuff. You don't have to worry about this. Okay, whoops. It's mostly page three where we're really going to start looking at stuff. Okay, and the reason why we're going to start at page three is because we really want to know why this is important for, uh, or how, how things are actually kind of put together and run, right? So the first thing you'll notice up here at the top is, is a transition, okay? It says the words fade in. Typically for you guys, you won't write in your transitions. I think there might be a box or, or an availability uh, portion for you guys to be able to do that. You don't need to do that um, because you're not proficient yet. Right? So you're not really thinking about transitions in so much as you're thinking about story first, so you won't start with that. However, you'll see that next to these numbers, one, two, and three, these are what are called the scene headings. Okay? These scene headings tell us where we are at as the action and the dialogue roll forward. Okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So we're going to fade in, and our first place that we're going to be at is a river. Is a river interior or exterior? Right? And the answer is, it doesn't matter, actually, because it, it's, if you're under the water or on top of the water, it's not really an inside or an outside thing. So water's a little bit different. But typically, when you're dealing with land sequences, interior, exterior makes sense. So for right now, we're just going to leave it as a river, because we don't know if we're really inside of water or outside of water. Just better just to label it as, as a river. Right? Here's the action. We, as in the audience, no, so it doesn't say you. It says we, right? So when we first start actually writing our stuff, anytime we're, just, we're directing the audience or the reader, we want to include them with us, right? Because they're going along on this journey with us, right? So we're underwater watching a fat catfish swim along. That's the first thing we're going to see. This is the beast. Cool, right? Then we're going to have the character of Edward say a line of dialogue. Now what's really interesting is right next to Edward, there's this parentheses with the letters VO in it. Anyone know what VO is? No? You like how you're shaking your head. You're a little ridiculous when you do know what it is. No, Mr. Sai. Okay, VO, voiceover. Okay, so whenever you see VO put in parentheses next to a character's name, we know that this particular line of dialogue is going to be voiced over the top of this action. Right? So this entire voiceover is going to take place as we're swimming underwater watching a fat catfish swim along. Right? Another uh, variation of this term is OS, which is off screen. Okay? So if someone's supposed to be saying something just slightly off screen, you would use OS as opposed to voiceover. Okay? But th that's another option to you. So now here's what this character of Edward, who's Edward? We don't know yet because we haven't been introduced to them, him yet, remember? It, it, this is just a voiceover. Right? Edward says the following, there are some fish that cannot be caught. It's not that they're faster or stronger than other fish. They're just touched by something extra. Call it luck, call it grace. One such fish was the beast. Okay, that's his line of dialogue. 
Next, we're going to go down to the next action sequence. The beast's journey takes it past a dangling fish hook baited with worms, past a tempting lure sparkling in the sun, past a swiping bear claw. Right? The beast isn't worried. Right? So all of this right here is taking place as this voiceover continues. That's the reason why the word continues right there in parentheses. As this voiceover continues. Edward continues by saying, by the time I was born, he was already a legend. He'd taken more $100 lures than any fish in Alabama. Some say that fish was the ghost of Henry Walls, a thief who drowned in that river 60 years before. Okay. Sorry. Water is your friend. Trust me when I say that. Right. Had to cough. Had to hit the cough button and take a, take a sip of water. Okay. Let's continue. Some said that fish was the ghost of Henry Walls, a thief who drowned in the river 60 years before. Others claimed he was a lesser dinosaur left over from the Crustaceous period. Okay. Next thing we're going to do, because now we're done with this scene, right? We did a voiceover for this part. We did a voiceover for that part. The next thing we're going to do is move to interior or inside. Remember, it's either INT or EXT. Will's bedroom. That's the setting. Who's Will? We don't know yet. We haven't been introduced to him. And what's interesting is that this is happening at night. Okay, so we're going to move inside of Will's bedroom at night. But now here's the difference. We're jumping back in time. We're jumping back to 1973. Now, Will's bedroom in 1973 is going to look way different than Will's bedroom in 2003, right? So that's the reason why the timing of the year is important, and that's why you add it in after the time of day, right? Because we don't need to know that until after we know the setting. We need to know if it's inside, outside, this actual setting, and then the uh, time of day. Then we can figure out year, right? Each one has a different look. So who is this Will character? Will Bloom, okay, age three. Tells you something completely different about that character than you probably were thinking, right? This is why these physical characteristics, personality characteristics, or relational characteristics are extremely important, especially as we're writing our story outline. So Will Bloom, age three, listens to wide, uh, listens wide-eyed as his father, Edward Bloom. Up oh, there's that Edward. Okay, so this guy down here, the, his dad, Will's dad, is doing the voiceover. As his uh, father, Edward Bloom, who's in his 40s and is handsome. Okay, we don't give it an exact date. We just kind of want to put it in a time period, a time space, and let you know that he's handsome because apparently that's important to this particular story. He continues to tell the story. In every gesture, Edward is bigger than life, describing each detail with absolute conviction. Right? So we know very, very uh, right off the bat, Edward is handsome and magnetic, right? Means that he, he draws people into him, and that his son is three years old listening to him tell this story. Edward continues, except this time he is not doing a voiceover, he's on camera. How do I know that? There's no VO next to his name anymore. Okay. So Edward says, I didn't put much stock into such speculation or superstition. All I knew was that I'd been, or that I'd been trying to catch that fish since I was a boy no bigger than you. Closer. And on the day you were born, that was the day I finally caught him. Now, what does that closer part mean? Okay. This is where our parenthetical comes into play. We're talking about a character or an object because it's in the middle of the dialogue, like I just got done discussing and talking about, right? It's in the middle of the dialogue. So what this means is that this character, Edward, moves closer as he says this following phrase. <clears throat> and on the day you were born, that was the day I finally caught him. Way different than moving in the camera shot. Closer, right? You'll notice that we actually haven't even started talking about the camera yet. Okay? The reason why we haven't started talking about the camera yet is because it's not important to the story. You really need to think about the story as you're writing, not so much about the camera work. We'll get to the camera work later on. But as you're writing a screenplay, the development of the story is paramount before the camera movements come and start at, or started to be added in. Remember, that's the camera script. Now, when you're writing an AV script, that's a little bit different. We do care a lot more about the camera shot as well as the dialogue. But for a screenplay, there shouldn't be mention of a camera. <clears throat> there might be a movement of we move along really fast 
behind an individual, which basically says that, hey, we, there has to be a camera movement behind an individual, right? We are moving together as the audience. But it doesn't say, uh, put the camera here and move the camera closer, right? Director fills that in later on. <laughs> then we move over to a campfire, exterior. Now we're outside, campfire at night in 1977. So now we move further forward into time by four years. A few years later, and Will sits with the other Indian guides as Edward continues to tell the story to the tribe. Now you'll see it doesn't say how many Indian guides. It just says the other Indian guides. It doesn't even really describe Indian guides. Indian guides are Indian guides, right? But you kind of get a, a good understanding of what Indian guides are based off of what he's discussing and talking about, right? Because it's not important. So remember how I talked about how you need to tell us everything that is that is needed, not everything that's uh, possible, right? Not being as detailed as possible. That's what we're doing here. Edward says, no, I tried everything on it. Worms, lures, peanut butter, peanut butter and cheese. But on that day, I had a revelation. If that fish was the uh, ghost of a thief, the usual bait wasn't going to work. I would have to use something he truly desired. Edward points to his wedding band glinting in the firelight. A little brave, confused, says, your finger? Edward slips off his ring. Edward says, gold. While the other boys are wrapped with attention, Will looks bored. He's heard this story before, right? So you can see with the action, we're describing what the characters are doing. With the dialogue, we're adding depth, right? Edward says, I tied my ring into the strongest line they made, strong enough to hold up a bridge, they said, if just for a few minutes. And I cast it up river, and then we continue to move forward, right? So that's kind of, that's, that is kind of where we're, where we're going to stop, okay? That gave you enough insight and enough information for you to go, oh, that makes sense. Right? So now what I want to do is instead of just taking a look at the script, I want us to watch the film. Right? How does this thing actually look when it's done, when it's complete, and when it's finalized? As we're reading the script. Right? So here we go. We're going to go ahead and start playing this. Right? So you'll see that when I start playing, we're supposed to do a fade in. It doesn't mention anything about the credits. But it does say we're supposed to fade in. Now, if you know anything about Columbia's TriStar logo, it normally uh, zooms out from the light and tells you it's Columbia. They reversed it for this because we get a fade in on a river. So you'll see we'll go into the light, and as we go into the light, we will fade in on a river, right? We're underwater, and we're gonna be watching a fat catfish swim along. Now, we haven't gotten to the fat catfish part yet, right? You can see that there are fish swimming. That's not listed in here. But we're supposed to be swimming along with a fat catfish. Here it comes. This is the beast, right? And you can see just how much bigger the beast is compared to those previous fish, right? Now, Edward's going to say there are some fish that cannot be caught as a voiceover. There are some fish that cannot be caught. Right? It's not that they're faster or stronger than other fish. It's not that they are faster or stronger than other they're fish. They're just touched by something they're just extra. They're touched by something right? extra. Normally they're supposed to say, call it luck, call it for grace. One such One fish, such was, fish was, was the beast. beast. But they cut out some of that dialogue when they were in editing. Right? And by the time the, I was the born, he was already a legend. The beast fish hook, which we saw already. He'd passed Faded up more $100 there you go. Now you can than see any some fish more. in Alabama. Right? Past attempting lure, past other stuff, but the beast is a Some fish. said that fish was the ghost of a thief who drowned in that river 60 years before. Others claimed he was a lesser dinosaur left over from the Cretaceous period. Others now claimed he was a dinosaur left Will's over from the Cretaceous period. Will's bedroom at night, period. 1973. Will blamed Will I didn't Will put Bloom, any stock three, into such speculation or superstition. Bloom, and 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 all I knew was I'd been trying to catch that fish since I was a boy. Describing each detail with absolute conviction. And on the day you were born? Well, that was the day I finally caught him. Right. Now we move now, exterior campfire, 1977. Worms, lures, peanut butter, as peanut butter and later, cheese. Uh, and we'll but sit on with that day, Indian I guides, had a revelation. Okay, as Edward continues to tell the story of the tribe. If that fish was the Edward, ghost of Henry Walls, uh, then the usual bait won't go to work. Lures, but on that day, I was going to have to use something he truly desired. Edward wedding band glancing in the firelight. Little brave confused your finger. Edward slips off the ring. Gold. Right. Now I tied my well, ring onto the, the boys strongest line the they made. Strong enough Will to hold up bored. a bridge, they said, if only so for a few minutes. So we have kids that are attention. You can see Will. He's bored. And then I cast up river. And he casts up river. Now we're going to move into your blue front hall, night 1987. Now this the is new. You guys haven't seen this before. And grabbed it before he even okay. hit the water. The beast jumped up and, and grabbed it before rising in the water. And just as fast as he cleaned, he snapped through that line. Will, now 17 with braces, is fuming, ready to leave. His mother Sandra, from when he gets his good looks and practicality, stands with him at the door. 
Okay. Wilson was going to say, Loeb insisted insistent, make him stop. He's now lost in the gut okay. of an His mother pats him sympathetically. Will's date. What, what did, did you, you do? do? I followed, followed that, that fish upriver up and downriver for three days and three nights. You can see they made a cut there. This fish, the right? beast. We cut out all this. The whole part. time we're calling Our the interior hit. tiny Paris restaurant at fact, night, 1998. Will now 28 sits with his gorgeous bride Joseph. He's going to lay the man in day. Right? Now I was in a wedding situation. reception. Edward's drunk. I could gut the that room fish feels cozy and, get and my drunk. wedding ring back. Right. Edward, this fish so is a beast. Became the smartest was fat with going to lay in them. the Ashton now River. Now I was in a situation. Right? I can get the fish, get the ring back, do all this other stuff, blah, 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 blah. Like Will can't take it anymore. Edward doesn't even notice. Edward continues, and as Will's leaving, Edward well, and Will we say the same, the same thing. We have part of the same destiny. We have part of the same equation. Will reaches the door as mother interception. Sandra, honey, it's still your night. Oh, darn, darn, it's still your night. Will can't articulate his anger. He just leaves, right? Edward's going to point out his finger. He's going to say, clo he's going to move closer. He's going to hold that his That was the lesson I learned that day. That was before this. The they cut that part out. my son was born. Right? This Sometimes story is, and has always been about her more than anyone else. To Edward's mom. To an uncatchable woman is to offer her a wedding ring. Right? So that was four minutes. In, right? From the beginning to where we're at. What page are we on? Page four. Right? So when it comes to putting all this stuff together, when it comes to us writing our scripts, as detailed as necessary, director fills in the possibilities. Right? So now that we've kind of gone over stuff, it's your turn to start writing your script. Right? I spent enough time kind of going over things. You don't want to start writing your script, though, until you got your outline done, your treatment done, and your pitch ready to go. But, uh, but for today, I'm going to get you guys started on how to write your script. Because if you don't know how to write your script, it's going to be very difficult for you to, to, to actually get through everything, right? So um, let's go ahead and, and jump into that. Uh, let me go ahead and pull that up here. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize that and minimize that. Cool. Right? So in order for you guys to be able to write your script, you're going to have to go to a website called Celtics, Celtics.com. So if you guys haven't logged in, make sure you log in. Okay? And this is where I'm going to start showing you guys how to utilize Celtics. Right? C-E-L-T-X.com is where you're going to need to go. This is free. So if it says you have to pay, you're not doing something right. Right? You got to be able to do it right. That's right, Clyde. It's, you're doing good. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, Celtics is uh, being used by a bunch of different people um, to not only write uh, films and video, but also to write video games. Okay. I've been using Celtics since 2010 or 2011. It used to be Final Draft for a lot of people. There are still people that do utilize Final Draft a lot. Um, but Celtics is kind of the way to go if you don't have a whole lot of money. Story Creator is another one. Um, Final Draft is for the big Hollywood types, but Celtics is, is kind of the place to go. So Celtics is C-E-L-T-X dot com. And when you get there, where it says start creating your all-in-one studio, you're going to type in your nine-digit student ID at mvusd.org, and you're going to hit sign up. Okay. Now, when you hit sign up, okay, it is going to send an email to your email box. Right? So you're going to have to log into Outlook. Right? So if you haven't logged into Outlook, you're going to need to go search Google, find Outlook, find Office 365, and be sure that you can log in with Office 365 as well, so that way we can make sure that you're utilizing uh, um, the software correctly. Right? So I'm going to give you guys a little, bit to, a little bit of time to go through and do that. But that's how you're going to have to sign up. Right? Now, it's going to send you a verification code. Once you have that verification code sent, you'll be able to type it in. You'll be good to go. Okay. Until you get that verification code, you will not be able to get into Celtics. So you want to be sure you get that verification code. Now, for me, I'm good and done. I've already done this before. Okay. So I've already created my account. I can sign in. I'm good to go. Right. Um, so the, the stuff that you're going to see going forward is once my account has been activated, if you have problems with the activating your account, please see me. Um, or you can look up online, just do a quick little Google search, how to fix whatever on Celtics, and there's probably a, a, um, a way to help you figure that out. Okay. Sometimes when you log in, 
Okay, so you'll see mine and then, and then all this other stuff. Sometimes when you log in, you will see a screen that looks like this. It'll say that uh, it won't have this part right here where it says you'll need a Celtics account to use this feature. That's only popping up there because I'm not signed into my account, right? But sometimes when you sign in, you'll see this account where it says, hey, you, can you have to choose to pay a plan. Scroll all the way down to the bottom, go down to where it says, no thanks, I'll continue on a limited free plan, and you'll continue to be able to utilize this on a free limited plan. Right? Now I'm going to log in to make sure that I'm good. Cool, I am good. Right? So sometimes you might see this particular page, but if you scroll all the way down and you say, no thanks, I'll continue on a free limited plan, it'll take you into your Celtics area, um, no problem. Right? So why, why is there a paid version and a free version? Um, it's because some of them um, require you, uh, some, some of them have more features. Okay, uh, the paid plan has more features. The free plan only limits you or allows you to write three scripts at a time. So you can write a script and be done with it, export it out, which you guys will have to do throughout the year, but you can only keep three projects open at a time. Okay, so let's go ahead and get back into this. <laughs> All right, once you log into Celtics, there's a bunch of different things that you can do. One of the ways to start out is if you want to take a look at the new improvements, you can come up here and click on your notifications panel in the upper right hand corner but you don't necessarily have to do that. If you want to know more about it, you can click on the help part of the screen, and it'll give you more information about how to do certain things for Celtics, okay? <laughs> Water is my friend, give me one second. Right, okay. Right, so take a little bit of time, get yourself acquainted with the dashboard. If you look over here on the left-hand side, You'll see this is where all your account stuff is, where your projects are, you can manage things. There's video tutorials on how to do certain things if you want to, but uh, you don't have to you watch those video tutorials. I would advise it if you're still confused on how to do things. Okay? For you guys, you will actually create a new project. Now for me, it is not going to allow me to create a new project. Why? Because I've reached my limit of three projects at one time. Right? I already have too many different things that are available to me in here. So I can't create more until I get rid of a couple of these other items. Right? I have these items in here because I'm utilizing them as examples for you to see. So um, they're, they're, they're just in there for right now. I'm not going to create a new project. But when you create a new project, click up here, you will choose a screenplay or film and TV. Okay? So you'll see how mine is listed as film and TV right here. Film and TV allows you to write screenplays. If it's like a music video or something else, that's the audiovisual uh, script. And that's a different script we'll take a look at later on. If you ever want to share this with anyone, okay, on here, right here on the dashboard, you can choose share, and you can enter in the email address of individuals that you wish to share this project with, right? So if you have more than one person in your group that is doing the writing, which should be every group, okay, you should probably share that out, okay, so that other people will be able to utilize it. Now, just so you know, um, the individuals uh, that you share this with will have access to edit the entire project. Right? There's one person who owns the project, there's other people that share it. You can have multiple shared scripts. Okay? You, don't, you can only create three on your own. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind because you'll see that there's team members here. And then um, you can actually decide who you want uh, to utilize stuff uh, with based on who your team members are and stuff. Okay? But eventually you'll, you'll finish up with something like this. Okay? Once you're done choosing uh, film and TV, you will be dropped onto a page like this. Okay? When you guys first started off, you will not have this orange area right here where it says subscribe. Okay? For the next 30 days, you have access to all the features. Right now, I don't have access anymore to all the features. <coughs> so um, I will not have as much time to, to really utilize all this stuff. Okay? Um, but it is there, and it is available for you to utilize and for you to, uh, to use. Okay? Um, eventually those features are going to go away. All you're going to have is the script. Okay? Now, you should have a blank script right here. If you don't have a blank script, you can choose Add. You can go under Script, and it will pop up there for you to be able to utilize. You just have to type in the name of your script, okay, title of your stuff. I'm just going to write in Test for right now. And you'll see that I can add in multiple scripts for multiple projects. Right? So you can keep one project open and just dump in a bunch of scripts if you really want to. Um, or you can create new projects each time and share those projects out with people. It just depends on what you want to do. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my script. Okay? Now when I open up my script, your script is going to be a little bit different than mine. Okay? I'm going to go back here. I'm going to open up what you will see. When you first start out, you will see this. 
which is nothing more than a blank page. Right? When you actually have a script, it'll look a little bit different. Okay? And so I'm going to go over the differences between these two items and between these two things so you guys know it. I don't have a whole lot of time to spend to be able to do that because we are cutting, uh, cutting uh, classes uh, slightly shorter than usual today, and you're not going to have a whole lot of time to start on stuff. But I at least want to give you uh, the option to be able to start writing your script if you feel like start writing your script at, at home. Okay? So when you first start out here under, under this blank page, you're probably trying to figure out what are you supposed to do, right? Are you just supposed to start writing things? It's not quite the case. If you go up here in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see that there's a drop-down menu. Inside of this drop-down menu, there are eight, nine, if you really want to call it that way, different options for you to be able to utilize. Now you'll notice the first one up here is the act. So if you want to keep charge or keep uh, an understanding of which act you're in, you can utilize the act button. Typically, we will not utilize that. Okay. Instead, we will utilize the scene heading. Anytime you are moving to a new location, even if it's just for a brief second, that scene heading needs to be dropped in there because we need to know when we're switching from one location to another. Okay. Actually, hold on one second. So the scene heading is extremely important for you to be able to not only um, understand, but really be able to utilize extremely well. Sorry, looking up something here really quick, trying to see how much time I had left, and it's not that much longer. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the scene heading, right? So we're going to start out with either interior or exterior. Okay. In this case, I'm going to write in INT because my story is going to start interior. And you'll notice that as you're starting to write interior, it will automatically pop up the option for you just to hit enter, and it'll fill it in for you automatically. If you start writing E for exterior, it'll automatically pop up for you to fill in automatically as well. Okay, in my case, I'm going to start writing interior, classroom, and I don't need to hold down caps lock or anything else like that. It automatically capitalizes it and formats it for me. Hyphen, and I'm going to do day, All right? Because that's where my, the first part of my scene is going to take place. When I'm done entering a scene heading, I can hit return, and you'll see that it automatically switched my scene heading to action. Okay, so right now I'm at scene heading. If I hit return, automatically switches it to action. The reason why it defaults to action is because action should always precede dialogue. Remember, dialogue gives you depth. Action pushes the story forward. Right? Once I enter the action area, I can start writing up my particular story how I feel. So I'm not going to write anything right now. I'm just going to write out stuff, blah, 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 blah. OK, great, awesome, beautiful story if you can read it. When I'm done with that particular action, I can hit return. And when I hit return again, it'll drop me down to a new action line. Typically, you don't want to have more than four lines down of action before you switch to a new action scene. Okay? And the reason why I say that is because when you are editing and putting together shots, most of the time you want to separate your action by shot. So you don't have to, but most of the time you'll want to. <clears throat> Just so that we have a separation, you can almost start to see how many shots you have in your particular video. Right? If, if a collection of things are supposed to be together, cool, you can write out a, a, long, a little bit of a longer action scene, a little bit longer of, of an action dialogue and stuff, right? It's going to be shorter, that's fine. But once you hit return and move down, you, that's how you know you're good to go. Typically, you don't want to write more than four lines of action before you start moving into your dialogue or before you start moving to another action sequence, right? So let's say I hit return. If I wanted to switch over and instead start to say something, well, now I move from scene heading to action, now I'm going to move to character. So if I hit either, if I hit tab on the keyboard, it'll take me to character. Or what I can do is I can use the drop down menu and click this and choose character and it'll automatically add the character into the middle of the scene. Okay? So let's say I'm going to have my character say something like Mr. Sipe, right? I can write the character's name right there and when I hit return, it'll drop me down so I can write my dialogue, right? So this is where I would begin to write my dialogue, have all of my stuff in there, say what I'm going to need to say, and so on and so forth. And when I'm done, and when I hit enter, it'll assume that another character is going to say a particular line. Might not always be the case, but it's going to assume that's what's going to happen. Right? If you need to change that back to action, 
you can come up here, change it back to action, and start writing your action accordingly so you guys can write out what it is that you need to write out. Okay? When you're sequencing your script the way you need it to sequence, this is how it should look, right? And I'll go ahead and start reading this off to you, much like the one we just got done taking a look at, right? This is actually what we used for the Scholar Bowl last year for a video that we never actually used, okay? It starts off, exterior dumpster at night. A dumpster is sitting, lonely, some trash is on the ground, litter, remnants discarded in a place where no one cared to properly dispose of them in the bin. Then suddenly, warp. Three high school students, uh, three high school wizards slash witch, witches apparate in front of the trash bin. Each one looks hurried and rushed. They're determined to meet their goal, but what is their goal? The three students gather together in hushed voices. There's a rush of wind that waves, uh, that waves over them. They look up, uh, look up as, if they were going to be, uh, as if they were going to be attacked. Boom, a Dementor the surprise is Wizard 1, knocking him backwards, right? So we now know Wizard 1 is a him, and it's knocking him backwards. The Dementor wastes no time and begins sucking the soul out of Wizard 1. Seeing this, Wizard 2 and Wizard 3 leave their positions behind a wall. They both stand to face the Dementor and, and combine their wands together to form a weaker Patronus spell. Wizard 2 and Wizard 3 at the same time say the words Expecto Patronum. A bright light appears in front of the witches and wizards. The Dementor is repelled in the, uh, by the brightness of the light. It stops sucking the soul of Wizard 1 and begins to, re to retreat into the darkness. Right? You get a very good understanding of what's happening in this particular script where there's not a whole lot of dialogue. Now, eventually there will be dialogue where wi Wizard 3 loudly whispers, guys, I don't think, and then the Wizard 3 gets cut off before he's knocked down to the ground. Right? There's, there's a time where people are shouting things. It's not multiple exclamation marks. Right? It's a singular exclamation mark and telling us that people are shouting based on uh, the, the parenthetical. Right? You'll continue this process all the way through as you're beginning to write your script. Now, if you need to take a look at, let me go come back here. If you need to take a look at um, uh, scripts, or not scripts, if you need to take a look at, uh, yeah, actually scripts, now that I'm thinking about it, you can always go to our haiku page, and you'll see that now underneath story outline and story um, treatment, underneath those options, you will see that there's different scripts for you to take a look at as examples. Okay. I'm actually in the process of dropping them in there right now so that way you guys can see them. Perfect. All right, cool. They're on the welcome page. Down here at the bottom, you'll see that you have the Dark Knight, Inception, and Lincoln to take a look at. If you click on either one of those, it'll open up in a new tab right inside of Chrome for you to take a look at. And you can see what it's like for a professional to actually go through and write a particular story. Right? So you can take a look and see how Chris Nolan wrote The, Dar uh, wrote the Dark Knight. Okay? You can take a look and see how all of this stuff is put together. Okay? So that way you guys get a better understanding of, of what to do from here. Right? So that's, that might be all the time we have for today. But it is, uh, is a place where I want you guys to start. Okay? Working on your pitch, working on your script. Next time, we're going to be talking about framing and proper storytelling. So that way, uh, when we start taking our, we can start taking our script and drawing out what our shots are going to look like. So we can see what it looks like when we begin framing and putting together our storyboards.